We'll begin reading at verse 1 here in chapter 19. 1 Kings 18, uh, 19 rather, beginning at verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he'd killed all the prophets with the sword. The Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw, he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise, eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He said, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking into pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a voice, a low whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Then he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The Lord said to him, Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael king over Aram. And Jehu, son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall come about. The one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elijah shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The reading of God's holy word. Be seated, please. Let's pray together. Lord, we come as your uh, servants seeking to hear uh, your voice. We come seeking the Spirit's ministry, both to empower the preaching of your word and to empower the hearing of your word. Give ear, O Lord, to our prayer and be pleased to hear and answer us in accordance with your good and perfect will, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When we took up our exposition of this 
19th chapter last week, I argued that Elijah didn't flee from Jezreel because he was terrified of Jezebel, that he wasn't afraid to die. In fact, after he'd gone into the wilderness a day's journey south of Beersheba, he asked Jehovah to take his life. Verse 4 of this 19th chapter. It's true that part of his reason for fleeing Jezreel was that he didn't want to die at the hand of Jezebel because that would have been scored a win for her and for Baal as well. But if we pay attention to the geography of the text, Beersheba was far enough from Jezreel to serve as a safe haven for Elijah. It's 200 miles away. Elijah need go no further. He did not need to go into the wilderness south of Beersheba. He didn't need to go to Horeb. He wasn't fleeing because he was uh, fearing uh, Queen Jezebel and, and her wrath. If fear wasn't his motive for flight, what was? I submitted to you that in spite of what Jehovah proved on Mount Carmel, Elijah saw, remember the way we wrangled with, uh, uh, we wrestled with the text there and sought to understand this not as a fearing but as a seeing what Elijah saw, verse 3, uh, he saw that things were not going to change. In Israel, he saw that Ahab wasn't going to change. He saw that Jezebel was still going to uh, be wearing the pants in the northern kingdom, that she uh, was still going to be calling the shots, uh, and that Israel would continue in their Baal worship and their covenant-breaking ways, and that he was broken for Israel's sake. And so he fled, not because he was afraid of Jezebel, not because he was dying, but because he was broken over the spiritual state of Israel. Remember as well that we wrestled with the question as to whether the prophet had gone rogue, as some interpreters have asserted. Had he, did he have Jehovah's authorization to... Proceed to Horeb. True enough, uh, it's very well possible that uh, it was under Elijah's own initiative that he fled from Jezreel to Beersheba. But what about his journey from Horeb, uh, rather Beersheba to Horeb? And we concluded that it uh, that because uh, it was because of his interaction with the angel of the Lord, the angel of Jehovah, the angel of verse five, who who uh, tapped uh, Elijah's shoulder, so to speak, who woke him up and said, uh, you need to eat, you need to drink, is the angel, the same angel of verse 7, the angel of Jehovah, who is, in fact, the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus, our Savior, before he was born in Bethlehem, is operative in this text, is operative in the life of, of Elijah. And Elijah goes in the strength of the food that the angel of Jehovah, Jesus Christ, gave him 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, to Mount Sinai, the place of, of the covenant the place of the Mosaic covenant where God made covenant with Israel. And furthermore, the, the redemptive historical parallels between uh, Israel of Moses' day and Israel of Elijah's day suggest that the focus of our text is covenant business. When Moses was up on Mount Sinai. Israel sinned against the Lord. They worshiped the golden calf. They broke the covenant. The covenant was received and the covenant was broken at Mount Sinai, even as Israel of Elijah's day had received the covenant and had broken the covenant. 
Now, why do these facts matter? Why does it matter that we uh, discover the true Elijah of the text? Because they dictate the way we understand the question that Jehovah repeats twice, why are you here, Elijah? And the answer that Elijah repeats when asked that question two times, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the, son of, the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left and they seek my life to take it away. Matters very much whether Elijah was afraid. Matters very much whether he was self-absorbed at Horeb, whether he was too concerned about his own, uh, what he, uh, as some interpreters see it, perceived as a failure in his ministry. Matters uh, quite a great deal. We want, we want, want to see in our text in verses 9 through 18 is that Elijah's mission at Horeb was to bring accusation against Israel for her ongoing breach of the covenant and to receive Jehovah's commission to serve as facilitator as judgment against her, as, as a uh, as facilitator of Jehovah's judgment against her. To bring accusation against Israel for her ongoing breach of the covenant, to receive Jehovah's commission to serve as facilitator of her judgment, uh, of his judgment, rather, against her. So we're looking at four things tonight. Uh, Jehovah's inviting question. Uh, that's uh, the question of uh, verses 9 and um, 13, Elijah's covenant accusation, Jehovah's quiet presence, and then Jehovah's covenant judgment and grace. Jehovah's inviting question, Elijah's covenant accusation, Jehovah's quiet presence, Jehovah's covenant judgment and grace. A lot of the text rides upon how we interpret the question that Jehovah repeats in verses 9 and 13. It's consistently been interpreted as a criticism of Elijah, a rebuke of the prophet. Now, it must be admitted that the question itself is ambiguous. It could be read a number of ways. Where's the emphasis? Is it, what are you doing here, Elijah? Implying that he ought not be here. Uh, then that when Elijah arrives at Horeb, Jehovah tells him twice that he ought to be somewhere else. That neither Jehovah nor the angel of Jehovah wanted Elijah at Horeb. Or is it, what are you doing here? Elijah. That is, what are you here for, Elijah? What did Elijah, Elijah expect would happen uh, at Mount Horeb? What was he hoping for there? The problem with both of these understandings of Jehovah's questions is that while Elijah may have headed south to Beersheba on his own initiative, as we have already observed, he went to Horeb on the angel of Jehovah's authority. That is, he went with Jehovah's authority. The angel of the Lord is God. The angel of Jehovah is Jehovah himself. And therefore, uh, that journey was, was not only under the initiative of Jehovah, but it was in the, the, the divine strength of, of the food. The 40 days and 40 nights journey was in the divine strength of, of the food and the drink uh, 
uh, the supernatural sustenance that Jehovah provided for Elijah. Given the, this revelation of verses 7 and 8, given this divine authorization and this supernatural provision, it would seem that Jehovah's question is an invitation to Elijah rather than a rebuke. That is, Jehovah is inviting Elijah to ponder the reason for his presence at Horeb. He's doing to Elijah what he often did to some of the other prophets. For example, Jeremiah, Amos, and Zechariah in the visions that they would receive when he would invite them to reflect upon the symbols of the visions by posing a question. What do you see, Jeremiah? What do you see, Amos? What do you see, Zechariah? In Elijah's case, Jehovah's question is, what are you doing here at Horeb, at Mount Sinai, Elijah, where I made covenant with Moses? In other words, why have I brought you here, Elijah? The question then becomes, why has Jehovah led Elijah, his prophet, to Mount Horeb, to Mount Sinai? What did Jehovah intend to reveal in this redemptive historical moment? And the answer to Jehovah's question is in Elijah's answer. That brings us then secondly to Elijah's covenant accusation. The prophet's identical answers of verses 13 and 14 are a reflection upon Israel's current covenantal state, which parallels Israel's past covenantal state in the Mosaic Covenant. First, Elijah says, I have been very jealous for Jehovah, the God of hosts. The Hebrew expression for very jealous is intensive. Uh, with jealousy, I have been jealous for Jehovah. That's how we would uh, translate this uh, woodenly. Jealousy remembers an attribute of God. Jehovah's jealousy was the basis for the prohibition of idols in Israel in his word to Moses, interestingly enough, on Mount Sinai in the ten words that he gave to Moses there. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Elijah says, with jealousy, I have been jealous for Jehovah. I stand with Jehovah in his jealousy against the idolatry of his people Israel. Second, he says, the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant and torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And that's what, uh, partially what Elijah told Ahab. You remember chapter 18 and verse 18. You've forsaken the commandments of Jehovah, and you have followed the Baals. And the narrator has, uh, mentions two expressions of uh, the people's apostasy. They had killed Jehovah's prophets, 
Chapter 18, verse 13, and they had torn down Jehovah's altars. Chapter 18, verse 30, that's Elijah's sentiment in his answer to Jehovah on Mount Sinai. Elijah says he's upset for Jehovah's sake. He's upset for Jehovah's cause. The Hebrew underscores this by placing the emphasis on the direct objects, especially your altars and your prophets. Elijah only mentions his own case as illustrative of what Israel had been doing in the northern kingdom. They'd been killing the prophets of Jehovah. Rather than being self-absorbed and self-concerned and self-serving over his failed ministry or threats to his life, Elijah is at Horeb to charge Israel with apostasy. I submit to you that Jehovah brought Elijah to Horeb for this purpose. That Elijah's mission at Horeb was to bring covenant accusation against Israel for their breach of the covenant. Might even be the case that it's stated informally here in response to Jehovah's first question, stated formally in response to Jehovah's second question, what are you doing here, Elijah? So what distressed Elijah wasn't fear of Jezebel. It wasn't fear of a failed prophetic ministry but that history was repeating itself in Israel's idolatrous apostasy. When Moses had been on Mount Sinai see, receiving uh, the covenant, the Ten Commandments, the people had worshipped the golden calf that Aaron had forged in the fire, Exodus 32, verses 1 through 6. You remember the northern kingdom's Idolatry had begun with the golden calves at Dan and Bethel. Things had devolved in Israel. In Jeroboam's time, they'd never been worse. But they devolved as, as though it were possible to get any worse, as, there, as though there were any uh, it, as, though, as though there was anything worse than what Jeroboam did in, in uh, informing these idols at Dan and Bethel, the golden calves at Dan and Bethel, and then the innovations that he uh, created in worship, the false altars of worship that Jeroboam built, now the northern kingdom had plunged headlong into idolatry, into Baalism. And that was the state that the prophet was dealing with. And given the parallels between Moses and Elijah, it's, it's as though Elijah's Words to Jehovah are here we are again. After all these years, the people of Israel have returned to the same idolatrous, idolatrous muck of, of the days of Moses. I find myself reliving Moses' experience far more than I find myself comfortable doing. 
Jehovah's inviting question and Elijah's covenant accusation gives way to Jehovah's quiet presence. Verses 11 and 12 uh, provi- uh, present rather uh, an interpretive difficulty. How are we to understand these verses in the context of 1 Kings 19? You can't read these verses without a feeling of their climactic force. And after the fire, a voice, a low whisper. However, we translate that last phrase in verse 12. One thing is clear. The quietness wasn't absolute. Because we're told in verse 13 that Elijah heard it. Although the Hebrew word can mean sound or voice, For reasons that will hopefully become evident, it seems important to translate it voice in this context. How are we to understand this divine manifestation? Well, some think it was uh, in line with what they thought of Elijah, his fear, his self-absorption. Some think it a rebuke to Elijah, an implied rebuke of Elijah's methods. And not only, quote, for biblical prophets, uh, one interpreter writes, but for all religionists who rely on shoutings and flurries of action while neglecting the way of quiet love, simple piety, and persuasive kindness. This particular interpretation has led to a pietistic application of the text, the quest for hearing God's still, small voice. Others hold that Jehovah, uh, Jehovah's not being in the wind, the earthquake and fire, is, is something of a broadside at Baal worship. Not being in them, Jehovah is refused, refusing to use uh, the Baal modes of uh, revelation, uh, of, of worship. The interpretation that seems to fit best, however, is that Jehovah, in this voice, a low whisper, is especially present in his word, which the following context will show to be a word of judgment and grace. Jehovah wasn't in the wind, earthquake, and fire. These are uh, precursors to Jehovah's arrival. But he's in none of these, the text says. After the fire, however, there's a voice, a low whisper. The text doesn't say that Jehovah was in the voice, the low whisper. But clearly, this is the signal to Elijah that Jehovah was present. How do we know that? Because following the voice, the low whisper, verse 13, Elijah heard it. He wrapped his face in a mantle. He went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. He was expecting something. He was anticipating the presence of the Lord. The voice of the second part of verse 12 appears again in 13b. A voice came to him when he went to the entrance of the cave. A voice came to him and said, What are you doing here? Elijah. A second time. The question was first asked in 9b, the second part of verse 9, in the word of Jehovah that came to Elijah. Reasoning from the context then, 
the voice in the second part of 13b is identified with the word of Jehovah, and by extension, the voice, a low whisper, of the second part of verse 12 is also identified with the word of Jehovah. And the following context seems to confirm this. Since after the voice asks the question in the second part of 13, once again, and Elijah answers, verse 15 begins with, then Jehovah said to him and pr proceeds to announce both judgment verse uh, here, verse uh, 15 through 17, and then grace in verse 18. So, Jehovah's inviting question. Jehovah's covenant accusation and Jehovah's quiet presence. And if our biblical reasoning is sound here, the contrast we're meant to see isn't between flurries of activity and a kinder, gentler prophecy, prophet, or ministry, but between the spectacular and Jehovah's presence, even in his quiet word, in a low whisper given to or given through his prophets, a word that directs history and preserves his people. And that's what we find in this last point, Jehovah's covenant judgment and grace. Jehovah is sovereign over history. No surprise to you there. You've heard me say that a number of times throughout the exposition of 1 Kings. It's one of the great themes of the book of 1 Kings, one of the great themes of the Bible. Jehovah is in control of the nations, and he commands Elijah. He commissions Elijah, verse 15, Go, return your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you've arrived, you shall anoint Hazael king over Aram. Now, it was common for prophets of Israel to anoint kings of Israel, but it wasn't common for prophets of Israel to anoint kings of other nations. That's evident if you've read the Old Testament. God's purpose was to use this king from Damascus to bring judgment against the house of Ahab. Hazael killed all who remained to Ahab in Samaria until he had destroyed him according to the word of Jehovah, which he spoke to Elijah, 2 Kings 10, 17. This is generations later. Nevertheless, it's the judgment of Jehovah. Jehovah also had a king and a prophet in mind for his own people. And so he further commissioned Elijah, verse 16, Jehu, son of Nimshi, you shall anoint over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Now, you remember Jehu was a military commander, both under Ahab and under Ahab's son, Joram. At the command of Elijah, Jehu executed a purge of the house of Ahab. 2 Kings 9, verses 1 through 10, 17. He also purged the northern kingdom of Baal worship. He successfully carried out a cunning plan to gather all the prophets of Baal and all the Baal worshipers in the northern kingdom in the house of Baal and to destroy them in the house of Baal and to turn it into a latrine. This is God's judgment through this king. Uh, Jehu is the only bright spot in the future of the northern kingdom. 
His kingship is mixed. It's good and bad. But he's the only king in the succession of kings following Jeroboam the first that had any good whatsoever in his kingship. And then Jehovah was also sovereign uh, over his people. He appointed Elisha as prophet over uh, his people. Eli he appointed Elijah to, to uh, take up the mantle, uh, literally, from Elijah and to carry out his uh, work in keeping Israel accountable for their uh, idolatry. But Jehovah was also sovereign over the spiritual destiny of his people. And he had grace in store for them. Therefore, th therefore, while he would severely judge the northern kingdom for their apostasy, he says in his word to Elijah, verse 18, Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The promise is just one example of the remnant theology that permeates Scripture. God always preserves a remnant for, for salvation, even down to the present day. Citing this very account in 1 Kings 19, Paul testifies in Romans 11, 2-5, God has not rejected his people Israel, whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what he says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars. And I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him, Paul asks? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And Paul concludes in the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time, in the time of, uh, in the day of Paul, a remnant according to God's gracious choice. How far does this promise that God gave to Elijah extend? It extends to the Apostle Paul and extends throughout the ages of the church. And one of the things, dear Christians, that we ought to tuck in our pockets and take away from this text is that despite all appearance to the contrary, in any age of the church, we must believe God's promise of a remnant God always preserves a remnant in every age of the church of Jesus Christ. And we must believe it. Now think of the faith required of Elijah to believe this promise of God. That God has reserved, had reserved 7,000 who hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. Think of the faith in the midst of this covenantally destitute nation. This nation that had plummeted into the worship of Baal, that the Lord would be pleased to actually preserve a remnant of Israel out of the midst of that muck of apostasy. Remnant theology is akin to the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. It's a theology that we see in, in every era of the church 
The prophet Isaiah was so confident in God's promise that a remnant of the house of Jacob would be rescued from the clutches of Assyria that he named his son Shear Jashub. A remnant will return. This is a man who believed in God's promise of a remnant in covenantally desperate times. Do you have Isaiah's faith in our age? Do you have the faith that Jehovah asked of Elijah in his age? An equally important application is that we must adopt Elijah's holy passion for the covenant. We must be a people who have great passion for this covenant theology that is pervasive in, in God's word, in, that, that stretches throughout all the ages of, of God's people. Do we not hear in Elijah's answer to Jehovah a theology and an experience that disturb us? Could you or I earnestly respond as Elijah responded when Jehovah said, Elijah, what are you doing here? I've been very zealous. I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Do we really care that much about the infidelity of the professing church? Does the doctrinal indifference and the idolatrous pragmatism of the church today ever get us upset for God's sake? Is Elijah depressed? Is he despondent when he's in the wilderness south of Beersheba? I think he is. But why? Over what? That's the question. Over Jehovah's interests, not his own. His covenant. His altars, his prophets. What is it that you get depressed about? Do you ever get depressed for God's sake? Are you ever despondent for the sake of Jehovah? Do you share the indignant posture of the psalmist toward the violation of God's law? Psalm 119, 53, burning indignation has seized me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Have you ever wept over the disobedience or the disregard of God's law on the part of the rebellious? Psalm 119, 136. My eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep your law. May Jehovah, the God of the covenant himself, 
work in us such holy passion for his covenant interests, his word, his worship, his church. Let's pray. We have to admit, Lord, we admit that we are conflicted within ourselves, if we're honest. That our faith is weak, and that when we read the promises that you make concerning your people, your kingdom, your church, They seem fantastical to us. They seem beyond reach 